It was one of the most difficult times in my career. I was angry, I was furious, because I felt that I gave everything to the club. I just felt it was dealt with really badly again. I think Bozzle went through, through, through moments of extreme, extreme professionalism for numbers of months in a row to then falling off it and going the other way. I think he liked life. That's for me, as a player, I, I hated the most lack of honesty and it seems to me there's a lack of honesty there and I feel for, for Aaron Ramsdale massively. Hello, I'm Jeff Stellinger. This is Football's Greatest. Each week I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince and the moments that will stay with you for life. Today's guest has played for Middlesbrough, Fulham, Chelsea and Leicester City. He earned 109 Australian caps and kept more clean sheets than Mrs. Miggins' guest house. Considerably more, actually. Welcome, Mark Schwarzer. Pleasure. Were you always going to be a goalkeeper? Was that always the plan? No. No, my dad, it's my dad's fault. So he was, um, I was playing, like most kids, I wanted to play as a striker. You want to score goals, you want the glory, of course. That's where all the action was. And particularly when you were growing up at a young age, uh, in those younger ages, it was literally, you know, all one-sided. It was either scoring loads of goals or you conceding lots of goals. So no one ever wanted to be the goalkeeper until my dad was the coach. And so then he put me in goals because I just had to do as I was told. <laughs> one of my sons was a goalkeeper, in fact, and I told him whatever. Whatever you do, son, when you go to your first school, do not tell them you're a goalkeeper. Tell them you play out. Absolutely. Because fir the first team is named and he's the goalkeeper. Yeah, anyway, never mind. There's something about goalkeepers, but we'll come to that later. Um, look, I think you first played as a pro at about 19. And the role of the goalkeeper has changed a lot, hasn't it, since then? It has. I mean, even, even before that, I mean, I think the period I grew up through, and, and there's a lot of guys in that sort of same category, um, there were so many rule changes. I think there was like three or four at least where the, the, the position or the, the the expectations or the demands of a goalkeeper changed completely. I mean, from being able to receive the ball back in your box, pick it up, no matter from whom, you could roll it with your hand along the ground, then you had to pick it up again. And then it was to um, only four steps, then no one could pass the ball back to you only by a thigh or a header to um, then it was a, a six second rule. So. Um, it, it changed a lot. And fortunately for me, it happened still while I was young enough and I was able to adjust. Um, and uh, it was, I think, about 17, 18 when the back pass rule came in. Mm. And I had to to try and learn and try and adapt really quickly. So w what do you make of the, the current mode that keepers have got to be able to play with their feet? You know, the, the emphasis used to be just on shot stopping and taking crosses, didn't it? But it, it's different now. Yeah, when I first came to England, Alex Stepney was a goalkeeping coach at Manchester City and I was on trial there. And he said to me, what we want to see in uh, goalkeepers over here in England is holding the ball and be able to kick the ball long. And that was pretty much the instructions. Yeah. And and if you even if you just take those two elements of it, most goalkeepers don't catch balls these days. It's almost like a dying art. Yeah. Um, and it's... And I know this from a lot of people I speak to, it actually looks better when you parry it. And that's often what the, resp the type of response I get from goalkeepers. Um, certainly my son says it. He says, dad, there's no point catching everything because it doesn't look as good. Nobody thinks it's that good a save then. And I go, yeah, but I know it's a good save. I, can, I know when you catch the ball, particular shots, I know that's a really good save. Coaches, the people who know the game really know that's a good save. He goes, that doesn't matter because it, it more matters what other people think, mm. how it looks aesthetically. They're the people that get the most exposure. And that's kind of the way it's gone a little bit. I, I think, look, I think it was only, it was always going to happen that the, the position of goalkeeping would, have, would evolve, that playing with your feet was going to be always a big part. What worries me a little bit um, going forward there seems to be a lot, a lot of goalkeepers where on the technical side of actually goalkeeping, catching the ball, positional play, technique, I don't think is quite at the level it used to be. And I think a lot of that's because of down to the fact that they're, they're, they're focused so much on being really good with their feet. Yeah. So it, it, in some respects, today's goalkeepers are not as good as goalkeepers. I mean, if you look back at the, you know, obviously the Peter Schmeichels and um, the, the David Siemens and, and so on and so forth, other goalkeepers, you know, in the Premier League at the moment, 
um, wh whether it be Edison, Allison, David Raya, you know, um, Sanchez at Chelsea, are they really as good as the guys who were their predecessors? Well, I think, look, I, I think Allison, uh, Edison, I'd, I'd rate them very, very highly. I think that they're, they're, they're outstanding goalkeepers. Um, and I think all round outstanding goalkeepers, I have to say, um, I think Allison is probably the more the complete package from my perspective or what I like as a goalkeeper. Um, uh, Edison is kind of the newer version of the, the modern day goalkeeper in terms of outstanding with his feet, very quick, very agile. Uh, and that's where I go back to the, what I said before about the technical side of things, the actual art of goalkeeping per se, catching, um, positional play is a modern day version and possibly not as good as it used to be. It, it all, it all comes down to the, the, the different eras, right? So Back in the day, it was about holding the ball and being able to kick the ball as as far as you possibly could. And they were regarded as the best goalkeepers, the guys that could do that the best. Today, it's a different it, it, it's a different remit. So, you know, today it's about being able to play out at the back, start, you know, from a from a breaking up an attack to creating your own attack through transition and being able to play out at the back, being that extra player, outfield player, uh, with the advantage of being able to use your hands when you need to. You know, they all, you know, there's all there's merit in, in both lots of generations uh, or styles of goalkeeping. Um, and I think it comes down to preference, what you prefer. I, I would like a, a, a more of a, a hybrid version. I'd like to see more of a the, the modern day goalkeeper being really good with their feet, but also constant working more on actually catching balls mm. and doing the technical side of things that are better than they currently do yeah i, I just know as a, a fan there's nothing more frustrating when you see a goalkeeper under no pressure punch the ball when he could catch it but hey this is just a fan's perspective i think um were you ever rotated in in your playing days you know did you ever have a manager who said, I'm going to play you one week and you the next week? Um, I had it I had it at times, various moments in my career, and it more so had to do with, say, national teams, um, selective sides, certainly when I was younger. Um, when I kind of became uh, a regular, and that was only really, that only really happened once I came to England, then I sort of pretty much always was that number one. If I wasn't playing, then you're out and the other person's playing. But throughout my career since I've been in England, I pretty much up until the last three years of my career, I was always kind of the number one of the club. So no, I didn't really have that rotation. The only rotation you would have got, and I did, it did happen as well, is some of the cup games. So mostly league cup games where the manager will make a change, give the, the second goalkeeper an opportunity to play. But I also had that opinion and that, that mindset that I wanted to play every game. I was very adamant and I always said to the manager, because managers would come to me and ask me, do you want to play? And I'd always say, you, no point asking me. I said, if you're going to ask me that question, my answer is always going to be yes. If you come and tell me that I'm not going to play because of this reason and that reason, oh, I like it, but I'll respect it because you're the manager. So more often than not, they just, they, 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 they allowed me to play because I wanted to play. Yeah. Well, what do you think about the situation at Arsenal then when, you know, Arteta's brought in David Raya from Brentford? I mean, maybe you can understand it. His goalkeeper had lost his form, lost his confidence, but I don't think most Arsenal fans would say that Aaron Ramsdale had done anything wrong. Has he almost, as Arteta almost dug himself into a hole? You know, he signed a goalkeeper and regardless of how indifferently he's playing, he's almost got to keep playing him. He, he's only dug himself a hole because of what he said. And he said that when he, when he signed David Rea was there's no number one. Mm. And basically then he went on to, to say that, why can't I change a goalkeeper? Why can't I bring a goalkeeper on at a certain time? And again, cause I want to change it. I mean, I, I, I've look, it's maybe, bonkers, I'm, maybe I'm old fashioned, right? But I, I just don't know anywhere, anywhere on the planet that, that works. Mm. I, of course, it works in penalty shootouts. That that happens. Yeah. Obviously, goalkeepers come on when goalkeepers get injured. That's just a forced substitution. But to actually change it, uh, look, I, I don't see, ma maybe I'm blind, but I don't see the big difference between Aaron Ramsdale and David Raya. If any, if anything, to be perfectly honest with you, I think David, I think sorry, um, Aaron Ramsdale is a better goalkeeper, mm. all round a far better goalkeeper. So I don't understand it. I don't get it. I just hope that he's been honest with Aaron Ramsdale because he hasn't been honest publicly. So that that's for me as a player, I I hated the most. 
lack of honesty. And it seems to me there's a lack of honesty there. And I feel for, for Aaron Ramsdale massively um, because he's done absolutely nothing wrong. So for me, that tells you straight away, that tells you the whole story, yeah. that for me, Aaron Ramsdale's future at Arsenal is finished. Mm. Are we talking a lack of honesty or, or is it just a lack of judgment? Firstly, it's a lack of honesty because you you say that there's no guaranteed number one, but then you put someone in, you change them for no 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 reason. You play someone, he doesn't play very well, he makes a lot of mistakes along the way and you still don't change him. So when you've said, certainly publicly, I don't know what he said behind closed doors. I'd be surprised if he said publicly there's no guarantee of number, who's number one and then telling Aaron Ramsdale, actually, you're number two now. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't you just say it publicly? I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so... And, and that's also the difficulty and, and in, in football is that there are too, too few people who are honest with you. And as a manager who manages football teams and, and, and groups, far too often there's a lack of honesty. I, I wonder what impact it has on the team as well because, I mean, don't tell me the players aren't going off into little huddles and saying, why isn't Aaron Ramsdale playing? I'm sure there will be discussions. I'm sure players will say something. I mean, they'll probably talk to Aaron Ramsdale about it. There will be some sort of discussions. But ultimately, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, ruthless environment, right? Everybody wants to make sure that they're playing, they're doing well, they're keeping position. Yeah, you're not, not particularly happy about anything, but once that team's picked, you've got to go out there and play. You, just, you, you can't think about who you're playing with or not playing with, who should be playing, who shouldn't be. There are things you talk about afterwards. There are things you think, oh my, if we only had so-and-so playing, if Aaron Ramsdale was playing, that probably wouldn't have happened. Um, so yeah, I think that's, they're the discussions that people do have, but in general, it's also looking after number one everybody looking after themselves first and foremost so it can be a pretty 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 lonely place must have been terribly difficult for him you remember the tv coverage where he was david rise made a great save and and Aaron ramsell is very visibly applauding him you know which is a it must have been a very difficult thing to which do. he also received criticism of course for. he did jamie carragher said which, he's doing which, it for the cameras which is crazy yeah. like it's absolutely outrageous to think that i mean the guy the guy showed such class um, as hard as it must have been for him, right? But he showed sh such class and acknowledging a, a, a fantastic save. Um, don't know why you need to read between the lines. I don't think there's anything to read between the lines there. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you please to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. Let, let's move it back to you because um, I want to talk a bit about your career. Um, obviously, you, you played in Australia, you played in in, in Germany and your first club here was Bradford City how did that come about well I I was in Germany I wasn't playing um I was I was still quite young um long story got a chance to trial at Manchester City at the time Steve Copper was the manager um and they were looking for a goalkeeper and I went there trained trialed played a friendly game behind closed doors played really well trained really well they wanted me to play a reserve grade game and it was only a couple of weeks down the line until the next resi game was on. So I had to go back to Germany. A couple of weeks later, came back, played against Bradford City in a reserve grade game away at Valley Parade. And the story goes that Phil Neal was the coach for Manchester City Reserves and the assistant manager. He went into the office to Chris Kamara and said that I've got this goalkeeper. He's over from on trial and he's looked good at training. I hope you've got a strong team out today. He goes, oh yeah, we've got a strong team. We've got a couple of first team players coming back. Yeah, yeah, you know, should we should test him. Played, I played well, we won one nil. And off, oh, I was sitting on the bus actually outside the ground. We've got fish and chips arriving off the, <laughs> man, <laughs> and uh, which I loved at the time. And I got a call from my agent in here in the UK saying, Chris Kamara's just been on the phone to me, wants to sign you on loan. I went, well, I said, really nice. I said, first and foremost, I don't want to go anywhere on loan. Secondly, um, got to give Manchester City the benefit of the doubt. They've got first option on me. And and basically, long story, Steve Copper resigned um, a couple of days later um, because apparently I was the last player he tried to sign. And Manchester City said, no, you can have him on loan. And I was about the fourth player that uh, happened, even though they promised him a lot of money at the time to buy players. So he resigned. Phil Neal wanted me. There was a massive mess messing around with a contract, typing mistakes, all sorts of stuff. And that's where then Bradford City, the door opened up for them to come in and make an offer. And and I ended up signing with Bradford City and I felt that Bradford were under less pressure. 
the manager was under less pressure. I wanted stability and I wanted to try and find a manager that believed in me and was going to give me an opportunity to play. And Chris Kamara was that man. I, I, I didn't realize till this day that Cammy had signed you. Yes. You know? Yeah, he did. So it was the one good decision he made in his managerial <laughs> career. Yeah, you know? possibly. I'm not really sure. I mean, look, he did really, really well. They stayed yeah, up that season as well. Yeah. So um, they did incredibly well that season, staying up. Uh, I think it was like the fifth goal could be to play for him in that season. I had a buyout clause in my contract and it was supposed to be, the, my understanding, the way it was negotiated was that it would only come in effect at the end of the season. So I, my understanding was I was at Bradford City to the, at the very least until the end of the season. I signed for two and a half years and 13 games in, three months in, uh, I had a couple of clubs come in and, 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 and match the, the release clause and I was I was just in my age. I said, "What's going on?" And they said, "Yeah, that didn't write it in that you had. It was only until the end of the season. It, it was whenever." So in the end, it was um, Everton, Middlesbrough were the two Premier League clubs, and in the end, through through again back to what I said about Chris Kamara and feeling wanted and 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 important. It's exactly how Brian Robson and Viv Anderson made me feel when they wanted to sign me for Middlesbrough, whereas Everton were the complete opposite. Joe Roy was desperate to sign me, but the the president. Oh, the the, the chairman, sorry, for me it was for him it was just a game, and he wasn't interested remotely in signing me. So with Middlesbrough, it was literally done in twenty minutes. Wow! The whole conversation from contract negotiations to everything was done in and agreed in twenty minutes. And you were thrust pretty much straight into big games, weren't you? It's the I League was, Cup yeah. final. Almost yeah, I played my yeah. my debut for for Middlesbrough was a League Cup semi final away at Stockport County first right. league. And it was a wet and windy uh, night on a Tuesday night. And uh, we won 2-0. And yeah, it was great. Um, and then my first league game was away at Sheffield Wednesday. We lost 3-1. Came out, missed a cross. Got beaten to the cross. Thought, here we go. Should have come to punch it. And, well, yeah. yeah, that's probably true, isn't it? Um, yeah, would have worked today. Of course, you stayed there when it was for the longest time of any club that you were at and you enjoyed some success there as well i run you on a few years you won the league cup final i think 2003 2004 four. Yep. wasn't it against bolton but i looked at that run and there were a couple of penalty shootout wins yes on the way now you were a bit of an expert weren't you when it came to penalty shootouts i only lost one penalty shootout in my whole career wow and that was um asian cup quarter final match away in uh, vietnam against uh, against japan they were one of the hosts vietnam and we lost to japan that was the only penalty shootout in a proper tournament at men's football that i'd actually ever lost in my career so yeah one blip on my career in that regard w w was there a I mean, was there a knack? How come you were so good? I mean, let's let's mention the other, the, the big, big, big one, is shall we? It was the, the penalty shootout that got Australia to the World Cup finals in, in 2006 against Uruguay, where, you know, reading the press, and it said Schwarzer made two fantastic saves So in, in that shootout. So, so was there a secret? Uh, I suppose it was more about, I what I always did was I tried to stay on my feet as long as possible and react to to the penalty taker um of course there's an element of element of guesswork but it's by virtue of elimination slowing slowing it all down in terms of not moving before the kicker run up to the ball and, and was just about to kick because it then put a little bit more i just put a little bit more pressure on the kicker come I mean, the pressure's all on the kicker the goalkeeper's there if they save they save and it's great and it's wonderful um, and of course these days people expect goalkeepers to make saves but let's be honest, if, you know, 11 metres away, they should be scoring every time. And with the way the rules have changed now, they're making it even more and dif more difficult. It won't be long until they make the goals bigger and make yeah. the goalkeeper tie one hand behind his back before he can make a save. So, you know, they're, they're trying forever to, to make it even more difficult um, because goalkeepers were getting too good at it and saving too many penalties. Was the, the same amount of, um, of study went into no. penalty takers as there is these days no not at all no, no. no i mean you, you you didn't have you didn't have the information available to you you didn't have the video footage you, today every pretty much every single game on the planet at any decent level is yeah. is filmed is on somewhere recorded somewhere you can access it and you know as far down as each individual players right so no we we didn't have that it was probably uh, i would say Early early two thousands was when we kind of really started to get into analysing goalkeepers' penalties taking. And I think that was when the, when I first started to get on an iPad information about penalty takers. 
I'm interested when you, you say about, you know, one day they'll be making bigger goals. Uh, uh, when you look at some of the developments now, and look, again, my son, when he was a young goalkeeper, his goalkeeping coach was a penalty. The first thing they say was take big step forward, you know, big step forward. And, and it just seems to me that now the authorities are so intent on stacking all of the odds against goalkeepers. Does that really benefit the game? Well, they all argue and say that it benefits the game because it's goals. And goals is entertainment. Whereas I disagree in penalty, penalty shootouts. Penalty saves are pretty entertaining uh, as well. Absolutely. Um, look, you, you have to... Uh, my problem is the, the, the implementing of the rules. And, you know, that's another subject altogether. But I think interpretation and implementing rules is generally a big issue. You know, you, you see it every time at World Cup, start of Premier League season, start of every season... Right, we're gonna we're gonna really clamp down on this for the first three months. They clamp down on it, and then afterwards they forget about it and they let it go again. That's the fun, for me. That's the biggest issue. They just allow people to exploit the rules. So now goalkeepers, because of what happened at the World Cup with Emmy Martinez, now goalkeepers are not even allowed to even talk to anyone. Not even allowed to go up to anyone. They have to stay on the goal line. The minute they step off it, they get a yellow card. Look, what Emmy Martinez did, I thought, took it to a different, to another level, and at times was should have been stopped earlier, and in the final it should have been stopped. Yeah. But I blame the referee for that. I don't blame Emmy Martinez. I I blame the referee for that. Um, so now they're just giving him more rules to try and implement. But history has shown us referees generally don't implement them <laughs> consistently enough. So you've added more rules for them to try and deal with, and they don't really implement uh, implement them regularly enough anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you about the Martinez. You know, if the referee had stepped in straight away, you know, it wouldn't have become an issue. But Absolutely, 100%. I, I blame the referee for it. Yeah. Absolutely. And even, you know, you look at the hair, his first 18 months were incredibly difficult for him at uh, Manchester United. Look at it now, after he's left, they're still struggling. Yeah. Were, were um, they too hasty? I think it was the right time. Let, let's move, move on again. Um, so you, you're off to Fulham. Next, and again, you enjoyed, you know, plenty of success there. You know, fantastic um, Europa League run, didn't they? And beating Juventus and so on and so forth. Um, but, but tell me about, you know, how you almost went to Arsenal because Arsene Wenger was keen to sign you, wasn't he? Which must have been potentially a dream move. Yeah, I, even before I signed for Fulham, I had a chance to go to to Juventus and buy Munich. The, and and as, as appealing as they are, and and someone would probably listening going, what you chose Fulham over Bayern Munich and Juventus, and it does sound crazy, but I was, at, I mean, not, let's not forget at Juve at the time was was Buffon the number one, mm. at uh, Bayern was interesting, but Bayern Oliver Kahn had just retired, Michael Renzing was guaranteed to be number one, that was very clear from the from the president. And that I was clearly going there as a number two. And I I didn't want to go anywhere as a number two at that time in yeah. my career. So going to Fulham was was a logical thing. And being at Fulham and having the opportunity to go to Arsenal, I remember I remember the phone call. It was three days before we played our opening game against Germany at the World Cup in South Africa in 2010. Roy Hodgson called me and said, Look, don't really want to disturb you, but we've had a we've had a a call from the Arsenal, as he always calls mm -hmm. them. And he said, they've 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 made they've made an offer for you uh or they've showed their interest in you they want to sign you i thought it'd be right to call you and ask you if you wanted to go and i was like phew, i was like kind of like stumbling a little bit going well trying to think well, okay of course i want to go but how do i say this without <laughs> an, without being disrespectful and making sure that i you know play play the right respect and you know told roy how much i enjoyed being at fulham and how much i enjoyed working under him and the success that we'd had and almost winning Europa League and it's all that to Roy Gaffer. Like you said, it's the Arsenal. And there's a chance to compete at the very, very highest level. They want to sign me as a number one, play Champions League football, something I'd never done at that stage of my career. And I was 37 years old and it was almost like a pinching myself moment as well, going, hang on, how the hell are they even interested in me at this age? Um, but then believing in my ability, going, yeah, I could go there and do really well. I know I can. Um, to going, oh, this will be amazing. And he said, okay, I, I get it. I thought you'd say that. He said, all right, we'll make it happen. We'll just make sure that we get what we, we believe is right for you. Plus, Mike Kelly will work and make sure we get the right goalkeeper in and, and, and we'll make it happen. So I was delighted. Absolutely, you know, chuffed. Could just think about now World Cup. 
Um, didn't help. We lost the first game against Germany 4-0. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, that on the side, um, unfortunately for me, the the thing that killed my move ultimately was that Roy left then about three weeks later and went to, to Liverpool before anything had been done with with uh, with, uh, with with Arsenal. And Mike Kelly was still at the club, but the club were in limbo. They were trying to sign Martin Yoll as a manager. That kept dragging, because he was Ajax manager at the time, yeah. it kept dragging on and dragging on and dragging on. And we only signed uh, Mark Hughes two weeks before the start of the season. And Arsenal were kind of there, were interested. They made an offer. Then uh, Fulham turned it down. And my first conversation with Mark Hughes was, fi was finally an announced as manager was, you know, Gaffer, nice to meet you. Um, I'm sure you know there's been an offer made for me. I desperately want to go. I said, you of all people can understand. At this stage in my career, played a club like the Arsenal, opportunity to play European football, opportunity to contest for titles. And he went, oh, well, no, I haven't heard anything about it. And I was just like, that's where the whole roller coaster of events happened. And he avoided me like the plague as much as he possibly could. The CEO played all sorts of games with me. And in the end, you know, I even ended up having a meeting with with uh, the late Al Fayed. And he was uh, very adamant that unless Arsenal paid 10 million pounds for me, I wasn't going anywhere. Um, which in, in hindsight, it's, it's, it's a compliment. Um, at the time I was furious because it was just crazy to ask, say that, you know, they pay 10 million, I can go at 37 years old. And my understanding they'd offered already four, which was, a, I thought was more than generous for, for that stage. Um, and unfortunately, they just they wouldn't let me go and then i after finally on numerous occasions trying to have a conversation with mark hughes about it finally him giving me some sort of information that the only way he was going to let me go is if they brought in a replacement for me um in time and then i said to him okay have you got one in mind he said yes i do and it was shay given he said to me and he said and he said and i said well have you got any other options in case that doesn't work he goes no he says if he doesn't come then no you can't go so basically that was done and dusted it didn't he, he for whatever reason he didn't come and the way i found out that my complete my chance of leaving was watching transfer deadline day on sky sports news and seeing mark hughes leave the training ground and at midday and them say and some of the reporter was sky reporter asking him about so are there any more transfers coming in or out of the club he said no that's it we're done no one's going no one's leaving anymore and that's how i found out that i wasn't going anywhere you, you must have you know, this is a chance to go to arsenal one of the biggest clubs in europe and in, and play for arsenal wenger as yes. well um you, you must have had an incredibly bitter feeling about yeah. that i was really tough it was one of the most difficult parts times in my career i was angry i was furious because i felt that i gave everything to the club i just felt it was dealt with really badly again I, you know, I, I don't think the club dealt with it really well. I don't think the manager dealt with it very well at the time. Um, I was, yeah, they just was like, the more we ignore him, the more we avoid him, hopefully it will just die down. And I, I, it took me a while to get my head right because yeah. I was I was furious. I, I take it you and Mark Hughes were, were not best buddies then? Yeah, look, I of course I was angry at him, but I didn't hold it against him in the end because I get it. You know, you're a manager and, you know, you, you've got a goalkeeper that you, you know, you, you obviously has a lot of Premier League experience and I'd like to think did well for the club. And that's why Arsenal was even interested in the first place. And if we're going to lose him, we need to replace him for like for like or, or, or someone even better, whatever it is. Um, and if I can't do that, then no, I'm not going to let him go. Mm. So I, I kind of get it if I put myself in his position and I, I get it. Mm. I was just more annoyed about the lack of perceived effort to allow it to happen they just seem like no they just for me as the player they seem like no no uh um no effort whatsoever and that's what hurt me because it was like it's this is my chance this is my one and only chance to go to a club and be a number one at a massive club yeah was it harder harder to to focus on your game after that i mean absolutely did it I, I didn't play for another four or five weeks yeah, yeah i was my head was all over the place i was fuming i was angry it was the most i'd ever been any time in my career and i was falling out with people left right and center i was falling out with people left right and center just trying to get out of the club um and, and you know when you know it all dies down and oh, look i love my time at fulham the last two years probably definitely one as, as an enjoyable um but certainly those first three years were amazing. Okay. I mean, the first two years under Roy was outstanding. It was just 
the group of players that we had, the manager, the assistant, Ray Lewington, Mike Kelly, the staff, everything about the club was incredible at the time. Brilliant. I mean, eventually when you did move, and we will get it with the goalkeepers in a moment, I promise, but when you did move, you've, you, you've gone on to Chelsea. Yep. And, and one of the records you set there was you became <laughs> the oldest goalkeeper to make a Champions League debut. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Starbuck arrest. Um, group game, yeah, Starbuck yeah. arrest at home. It still give you a buzz then to be making, you oh, know, a Champions League appearance there. Yeah. yeah, it's a Champions League. Wow. You walk out there and that, the, you know, the national, the, sorry, the Champions League anthem gets played. It's just like, hey, I mean, my hair's, my hair's on my, my, my arms and my, my neck are standing up now because it's, yeah, it's special, really special. And I, I, I have to thank, you know, uh, Jose Mourinho because he kept his word. He said to me, you'll get a chance. You'll have an opportunity. I have to thank Petr Cech because, you know, he was a top class pro, top, top class goalkeeper, had a, you know, had a really good working relationship with him. I like to think I pushed him a little bit. I know we do have conversations about it every now and then when I catch up with him, have a bit of a laugh about it. And he used to say it to me all the time at the time. And he, he used to say stuff like to me, you know, because Christoph Lotion was the goalkeeping coach and he worked us crazily <laughs> hard, crazily, crazily hard. And he he would, um, you know, Petter would say, often he'd say, we're, we're working. And he goes, I'd be, he goes, I'd be exhausted. And then I'd look at you and you're like 40 years old, 41 years old, doing it and keep going and getting up and doing it and doing it and doing it. He goes, I can't be tired because if he's not tired, I can't be tired. I said to him, no, 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 don't worry. I was tired. I was exhausted, but it's just that mentality. And 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 had the opportunity to play. Peter was really, really professional because I remember the team was just before the team meeting. Jose Mourinho calls both of us over to the side of the room and says to us both, "Look, Peter, you, you're clearly number one. You know this game's an important game to finish top of the group. We'd qualify, but it was if we win this, we finish top of the group. I'm going to play Mark today. He deserves an opportunity to play." And he was like, "Yep." Totally understand. Great. And that's just our relationship the whole way through. Um, and Jose Mourinho was brilliant. I, I loved working under him. You know, I didn't like him from afar when I was playing <laughs> for Middlesbrough and all that, but I loved working under him. And, I, and look, everybody knows, you know, he's he's one of those people that has these highs and lows and all sorts of stuff, but he also demands so much from people. And I kind of enjoyed it. I liked it. And, you know, he, he also respected people that gave him everything. If he knew they gave you that you gave him everything, he had even more respect for you. Yeah. And and clearly it sounds like he was straight with you, he was honest Absolutely. with you. And from the discussion we've had today, that's obviously very important. He was he was like Roy Roy definitely was Gareth was Gareth Southgate had him was was hundred percent up front. Um and and Jose, hundred percent up front. Absolutely the whole way through. And they're, they're probably the three managers in my whole career that were Hundred percent up front with me all the time. So when we talk Petr Cech, at his peak, where would he be in your sort of goalkeeping? Oh, one of the greats. Order? One of the greats to have played in the Premier League ever. Absolutely. I mean, you look, just look at his record alone, and then add to the fact that he suffered a horrendous head injury, like crazy. And when you mm. speak to him in medium and you talk to him about it, it's even more admiration for what he was able to do, how he was able to come back, how he's able to play over headgear on. I mean, you put a headgear on and try and stand in a in a goal, your peripheral vision, the noise, the sounds, that's all muffled, adjusting to it. It's it's so difficult. And at that level, uh, yeah, it's utmost respect. And some people say, you know, he maybe wasn't quite as good as he was when before the injury. Maybe so, but Jesus Christ, that 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 bar was so high, he wasn't far off it, if not right at it, because he was brilliant. And there's there's look, every element of it, professionalism, dedication, goalkeeping, was outstanding. Yeah. Well, they've struggled so much to replace him, haven't they? Oh, yeah, massively. I mean, yeah. That's another story altogether. But yeah, I mean, often that is often the case, though, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It I is. mean, you, you look at. Any of the great goalkeepers that played, um, you know, even Juve to a large degree when when Buffon left, they struggled to replace him. When you look at Manchester United, they struggled to, to, to replace Peter Schmeichel. It took yeah. them numerous goalkeepers to find Edward van der Sar. Yeah. And even after that, they struggled really. I mean, even, you know, when you look at De Gea, his first 18 months were 
incredibly difficult for him at uh, Manchester United. Looking at it now after he's left, they're still struggling. Yeah. Were, were uh, they too hasty with De Gea in your view? Um, I I actually think I think De Gea did a, had an amazing career at Manchester United. I think it was the right time. Okay. I think elements of his game started there were cr things were creeping into it there were too many high profile mistakes certainly in the last 18 months two years of his time at the club and i think people took him for granted as well so when people start i think now you it's it's quite amazing hearing and seeing the the approach or the 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 the, the line of a lot of fans now manchester united fans and, and even in the press about david hair and shouldn't have got rid of him should him bring him back he's possibly coming back it's crazy because it takes people to leave before they realize what they had. And more often than not, that's too late. I'm surprised he's not gone somewhere else. I'm, I'm surprised he didn't, actually, I'm surprised he didn't end up at Real Madrid. I'm really surprised. Yeah. I do hope you're enjoying the show. I just want to tell you that you can follow us at, at Football's Greatest Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. And search for Football's Greatest Pod to find us on X. So going back to great goalkeepers, um, it, this is a difficult question. Is there one? Is there one in the Premier League over the years that you've played that you admired more than the others? I mean, I think you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot. I don't think there's one that stands out okay, necessarily. Well, well, tell us the guys who you, you admired then. Um, certainly, you know, Peter Schmeichel was right up there. I mean, I think he, he changed the goalkeeping position a bit. I mean, he was a little bit unorthodox at the time as well. Um, and his energy, his, his athleticism, um, craziness, madness. Um, he's demanding of his teammates. Um, there, are, you know, there were some bits of there that I wasn't necessarily a fan of, but overall as a goalkeeper, I mean, you can't, you can't, uh, I think you can't look away from the fact that he was right up there, one of the Premier League greats. Um, you know, David Seaman, I was a big fan of David Seaman for, for a lot of reasons. Goalkeeper, he was an outstanding goalkeeper. Heard a lot about his easy ozy approach to things, to training, to warm up. I remember playing against him watch, that many times and watching him in the warm up, like glancing over. And I'd been out warming up for half an hour already and he was still kicking the ball against the crossbar <laughs> with his arms behind his back. <laughs> and then he did like, literally like 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of handling and a little bit of diving and a little bit of this and that was it. And I'm like, like, wow, like, wow. And then you play against him and he'd obviously pull off saves and it, just, it worked for him. You know, it just completely worked for him. You don't see that today anymore. And I don't think that actually happens anywhere today, but that worked for him and he was right up there with one of the, again, Premier League greats. Petr Cech, we talked about him. Um, outstanding. Um also, right, I mean, I, I class him right up there with Peter Schmeichel. Um, absolutely amazing goalkeeper. Um, Edward van der Sar was, a, was an outstanding goalkeeper as well, you know, top, top class goalkeeper. Could, could he have played in the game today? Because he was pretty good with his feet, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was probably one of the first, first goalkeepers that was seen as like a proper goalkeeper that could play left foot, right foot at the back, um, could play. I don't know. Yeah, look, I, 100%. Because the game has evolved so much. The the training, the, the from a young age, goalkeepers are, are training with outfield players. They are expected. There are drills now created that are completely based around playing out of the back, goalkeepers playing. So, yes. I mean, he had the ability back in those days with those balls, with the way that we, we played back then, 100%. He would be right up there being outstanding today as well. So yeah, no doubt about it. Um, I, I was also a big fan of David James. You know, I, I loved his athleticism. I loved his his work rate. Um, I mean, some of the saves he'd made. You know, some of the some of the some of the games that he had. I also worked with um, Paul Barron for seven years. He also worked with David James quite a bit, and also Mark Bosnich. I'm a big fan of Mark Bosnich as well. I'll get onto that in a second. But David James, you know. I I would also I started throwing the ball like he did. You know, he had this sort of like side throw, um, almost like javelin kind of approach, throw the ball. I mean, he could throw it 40, 50, 60 meters and it would go like a bullet. Um, yeah, outstanding. Bozza, because Ozzy, even though he's only like he's about seven, eight months older than I am, he was the first Aussie goalkeeper to break through and make it in England. He was the guy that opened the doors for so many of us. He he 
kind of opened the doors for people to start look looking to Australian goalkeepers, um, Australian players. I mean, it was unbelievable at Aston Villa. Um, at United, there were, you know, up and down dips and, 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 and peaks and troughs. But, you know, he's an outstanding goalkeeper. Uh, he's a top guy. Um, utmost respect for him and someone that I certainly looked up to. I remember being in a camp under 19s with the Australian side and he was clear, he was the number one and I was number two, roomed with him. I just, I, I think I was a pain in the backside because I just bombarded him with questions <laughs> about what's it like playing in England? You know, what are you doing? How do you train? What do you do? You know, how do you live? You know, what's it like? All those sort of things, you know, and you used to dream about it and yeah. think, oh, one day I'd love to do that. Yeah, why why didn't it work for him at Manchester United? Because obviously, at, at mm. times, Sir Alex had some pretty cutting words to say about him. Yeah, Bozza Bozza's you know Bozza had his own way. Um, Bozza went. I, th I think Bozza went through 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 moments of extreme extreme professionalism for numbers of months in a row, to then falling off it and going the other way. Um, I think he liked life as well. And I think that possibly at times got himself in a little bit of bother off the field. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I, I, Did he arrive there at the wrong time as well? I, I think that yeah. definitely had a part to play. I think it was a hard one to, to come in and again, talk about replacing Peter Michael, who, who, who can, when you've had a goalkeeper of that level for that long, it's, it's really tough. Um, you know, we even... Bayern Munich's a great example, Oliver Kahn, you know, Mikkel Renzing didn't work. Jörg Butt was then number two and he played for two years, whatever it was, until they brought in Manuel Neuer and he was only a young goalkeeper. So their, 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 their succession plan wasn't, wasn't bad if you compare it to, say, Manchester United's. Um, but I also think there is a problem when you have a player that's that good. There is an, a level, there's a bar and an expectancy. So when you come in as a new player and you don't reach that bar or you maybe do it a little bit differently, people are uncomfortable with it or don't think it's at that level. And therefore there's a lot of criticisms. There's a massive spotlight on them. Mm. So it makes it more difficult. Yeah. I mean, look, look obviously your Australian goalkeepers have done well in, in this country. Uh, Australian players have done yep. well in this country, haven't they? You know, the Vadukas and the Kewels um, uh, and uh, Tim Cale and so on and, and so forth. But at the moment... The Premier League sort of bereft of Australians, isn't it, in terms of players anyway? What, what, what's happened? Um, I think certainly, you know, you go through generations of talent, right? So we certainly had a period of time of real talented players that went on to play at high levels throughout Europe. Coming through the ranks at that particular time, semi-professional league, there was no other alternative. You played semi-professional in Australia and you worked or... If you went overseas, that's where you were able to become a professional footballer and potentially make a living out of it. There was no in between. Whereas today we have an A-League, which is a professional league, in which we needed. And it's desperate to, to, to be successful. And it's had various degrees of success. Um, could it be better? 100%. But what it's done is it's created an environment where we have a professional league. Players are earning decent money, good money in Australia to live make a career out of it. So when they go overseas and if they go overseas and it doesn't quite go to plan after six months, 12 months, they're generally on the first plane back to a club back in, in Australia. And which is great for the league, but I believe it's has a negative effect on, on players, certainly on players, uh, developing then add us joining the Asian confederation and Asia has opened up and the market is huge and there's a lot of money to be made in Asia. So a lot of players are also opting to go to Asia yeah, as opposed to going to Europe. Because for me, the best leagues in the world are in Europe. There's, there's no two words, about it, two, two words about it. And for players to play at the highest level to get the best possible level they possibly can, they have to take that step to Europe. But I also understand the temptations of going to a club that are offering silly amounts of money that you probably never would make in five years, 10 years in Europe. Sure. But you make it in one year in Asia. That's the problem. That's the conundrum we're in. Yeah. So that's why I think we are kind of at a little bit of a stalemate. We seem to be producing some players now. You produced a player a few years ago who didn't hit the heights in that sense, but he was Hartlepool United's player of the year. He was called Joel Porter. 
Yep. And he gave me more pleasure watching him <laughs> than I think any other forward thinking player. You know, he was just brilliant for us. So, um, and spent quite a few happy seasons with us before he went back to, back to Australia. So no Australians really playing in the Premier League at the moment, but there is an Australian manager yes. in the Premier League yeah. at the moment, a former national team manager yep. as well, wasn't he? Ange Postacoglu. What do you make of what he is doing well? previously at Celtic, but now at Spurs. I think it's amazing. I think it's incredible. Um, do you know him at all? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I do know him. Um, I played against him back when he was playing for South Melbourne, Hellas in Australia. Um, he only played a handful of games for the national team, and I, I, I'm pretty sure we weren't. In, we may have been in camps again. I can't really remember. I have to actually ask him that question. Um, I never worked with him in the national team because I, I retired just before that. Mm. But obviously, I've had lots of conversations with him throughout the course of the time of him being in Europe as well. And uh, look, he's he's done an incredible job. Wherever he's been, wherever you look at his history, his career thus far as a manager, and certainly club football. I mean, national team when he was under 19s national coach, it quite, didn't quite go to plan it on his early days. But after that, when he was at Brisbane Raw, Melbourne Victory, then he went to national team, and then he went to Yokohama, and then Celtic, and now where he is now. Everywhere he's gone, he's had success. Everywhere he's gone. He's changed the style. He's changed the mentality. He's brought professionalism. He's brought a different level of professionalism and expectation and demand on players. He, he, um, he leaves every single club in a better position to when he arrived. There's, the transition is always, the, the 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 curve is always upwards. The minute he walks out the door, the curve continues. And so that, that speaks volumes of the man in terms of how he approaches his work, how he approaches a club, his, his um, mentality. Um, he's, he's, he's got the right mentality. He's got the right um, approach to things. So many managers you hear about when they leave a club, they live in a bad, such a bad state. They've annoyed so many people. They've turned so many people against it. They've, the players are all over the place. They're in disarray. This guy does it the other way around. Mm. And he's, it's no surprise he's had success. The, 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 the challenge was having the opportunity and very grateful for Celtic to give him that opportunity. And uh, even as an Australian, as, as someone who, who, who wants as many Australians over as possible, because we like to come back and give the Brits a bit more stick um, <laughs> and, 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 and outperform the Brits in everything we possibly can, certainly when it comes to sport. So yeah, so the, and the thing is, you, you, you might get given an opportunity, but you've got to deliver. And he, boy, has he delivered. Mm. Um, outstanding at Celtic. And and he's he, had to prove himself again a bit at Tottenham, hasn't he? Because, you know, people he, he, will cast a slightly jaundiced eye on what happens in Scotland because everyone will say, oh, it's a two-team league, anybody can win that. Um, so he had to prove himself again to Tottenham fans. You have to put it in perspective as well. I think people forget, when he went to Celtic, there were 25 points behind Rangers the previous season. He brought in 12 new players. He didn't change any of the coaching staff. He went in there alone. He didn't go in with anyone. So... And I remember when he signed, and obviously there was all that talk about who is this guy? That's crazy. It's mad. You know, this is going to be terrible for Celtic. To people saying he needs to bring his own people in. He can't go in there without his own people. He went in with no one. I asked him that question. I asked him, said to him, why? Why did you go there without bringing anyone in? He said because he wanted to give the people that were there a chance to show him to prove to him that they were on board and they wanted to to be part of the journey. And also he said, what it does, it keeps him on his toes every day. He's got no mates in there. He's not brought in someone that's got his back 24 hours a day. He can't trust everyone 100%. He has to be at his best every time he walks in that door. He's always managing. He's always, so he, it doesn't allow him to be complacent. And that's what keeps pushing him every time. And then going to, to Tottenham, I mean, yes, he brought in Mile Jednak. He knows Mile Jednak from the national team. He's never worked with Mile, but he knows him from the national team. So other than that, he's still working with completely different people. And it's the same approach. And he's confident in his own ability and he's confident in his own man management skills that he can get anybody on side. And he shows it. He showed it at Celtic. He showed it at Yokohama. Showed it at Celtic. Showed it at, uh, at Spurs. And we have reached the end of Football's Greatest. My thanks to Mark Schwarzer for joining us today. Next time on Football's Greatest. I said about... Madison three years ago I wished he'd gone to Tottenham then and played with Harry Kane he's got ability to score goals 
he's got ability to create goals, he understands the game, he's going into his peak, so defensively he knows what the team need from him. So at the moment, I think you know he's, he's ripe and he's got that little bit of difference, that ability to change a game. What he hasn't got in an England shirt yet is I don't think he's got quite the approval yet. When he gets the approval, like he has at Tottenham, when he does get that, he'll put... He'll... Well, approval from the fans or the management? Mm, management, or... management, yeah. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of Football's Greatest. And of course, if you're listening to us on your favourite podcast platform, please press follow so you get us in your feed every week. Thanks for joining us this time around Football's Greatest is a Folding Pocket production with BBC Studios.